It really feels like we should dance, don't you think? <laughs> Next time, right? Next time. Okay, beautiful. The last time we were together, we began talking about the North Star. I shared with you my experience as a child seeing the North Star with my father. And as a child who had and still has an innate inability to see constellations and formations, those nights when I could see exactly what my father was seeing were pure heaven for me. We also explored last week an idea given to us by Anna Bladal, one of the founders of Enfleshed. Anna and her partners at Enfleshed are the ones who have given us the beautifully reimagined Ten Commandments we are using in our series this fall. I have thought all week about Anna's belief that at the deepest core of who we are, there is a liberatory that brings a sense of freedom within the rhythms of wholeness and healing and goodness. This is a freedom that allows us to rethink and reimagine beliefs about ourselves as well as others, and it gives us room to dream what we can all accomplish together. We shared some questions Anna brought to us as our homework for last week. The questions are simple and yet oh so vital in helping to ground us in what is really important. The first question asks, what and who do we love most of all? The second goes a bit deeper when it asks us to remember the people, the values, the ideas, and the experiences that constitute the core, the through line, the pulsing heart of all we hold most precious, sacred, and irreplaceable. This morning I want to ask you to imagine once again the answers to those questions as your own North Stars, as we continue thinking about the original and the reimagined Ten Commandments. The original Ten Commandments are one of the most common portrayals of Judeo-Christian morals. If you were churched as a child, you can probably remember a few of these. They may live somewhere in your unconscious memories. If you didn't grow up churched, or you grew up in another faith or religion, or if you grew up without any religion, you still probably have seen them, memorialized in stone in a courthouse or on a monument. And yet, no matter how these moral imperatives have come to us, most of us don't think about them very often. And almost all of us have no idea of how we are supposed to live them on a daily basis. Because they are a set of do's and don'ts, these commandments have a lot more to say about what not to do rather than what we should do. When we think about the non-use or the misuse of these commandments, it's easy to see how many people in our world believe the Christian religion is simply an antiquated system of morals and religion which hinder individual freedom and human flourishing. I think today's Eighth Commandment, as reimagined by our friends at In Flesh, is so timely for us right now. In the book of Exodus in the Hebrew Bible, this commandment says, You shall not steal. In Flesh reimagines that commandment as, Do not take what does not belong to you. It seems simple enough, and yet all across the world, throughout all time, we have seen people in power 
and in governments taking and seizing what does not belong to them. The ancestors of what became the United States, a majority who were deists, not Christians, made certain religious liberty was enshrined in the U.S. Constitution. Many of the earliest people who came here had left their homelands because of religious persecution. Yet, of course, the meaning of this core American value has been debated throughout the nation's history. And we must remember this freedom was not for everyone. It certainly was not for the indigenous people whose land was stolen, nor for the people who were brought here and enslaved. And while it was about land and territory, this was only the first phase, as it always is. They ended up taking who and what mattered most in the world to the people whose freedom was being destroyed. We should have learned by now when governments believe they have the right to take away individual freedoms, it always leads to destruction. Our history in the United States is hard sometimes to think about. In the 1940s, though, amid the destruction and horror of World War II, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, standing against the loss of freedom across the world, took four elements from the Constitution of the United States that he called the Four Freedoms. The freedom of speech, the freedom of worship, the freedom from want, and the freedom from fear. And for many people, including the most prominent minister of this congregation, that made Roosevelt a communist and a threat. After the war, as some of you know, in Hollywood in the 1950s, being a communist could end your career and ensure you never worked again. There was an antidote, though, although not an easy one for some. You could join First Congregational Church of Los Angeles and receive a get-out-of-jail-free card. The church grew to over 5,000 members in those years. Being a member gave you credentials that said you weren't a communist, and in the midst of the lavender scare, you were not gay. But don't be confused. There were people sitting in the pews who were communists. There were people of other faiths and traditions. There were people who were atheists and agnostics. And yes, there were fabulous people who were gay. Just as now people sitting in these pews were amazingly gifted and talented. And for all those people who became members to get this stamp of approval and stop their lives from being destroyed, I am so thankful they were safe because they were a member of this church. Thank goodness the senior minister and the governing body did not know the truth or perhaps decided to look the other way. And thank goodness our history is not our present and it will not be our future. But we are seeing in our time conflicts we thought were long gone arising now not just from a power or a dictator, but instead from and with a movement known as Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism is an anti-democratic notion that America is a nation by and for Christians only. It is becoming more clear all the time the ways in which this is leading to discrimination and the violence we are now seeing against religious minorities and those who are not religious. 
Christian nationalism is a contributing ideology in the misuse of religious liberty as a rationale for circumventing laws and regulations aimed at protecting a pluralistic democracy. It is a movement that wants to reverse non-discrimination protections for women, for LGBTQ plus people, and for religious minorities. It is a movement that is positioning itself to take away the freedoms that allow us to choose who we are, who we love, and what choices we make about our own bodies. This is a movement that is taking from all of us that which does not belong to those who espouse these beliefs. The enormity of what that means feels to me like storm clouds, which are rolling in and have the possibility of turning into one hurricane after another. In the last two weeks, many of us have had loved ones who understand what damage and havoc those storms can mean. While the hurricanes have been front and center, there have also been other storms that have been brewing. They're ones that we are not as familiar with. This week, extremely strong, powerful geomagnetic storms from the sun reached the earth. And if you are fortunate enough to live in an area where you can see these northern lights the storms produce, you have been able to see unimaginable beauty. And I am very jealous of you. This week, people in the northern hemisphere across the world had the opportunity to see this magnificent natural phenomena. And yet within the beauty of the lights these storms produce, there is a danger they pose to our technology and infrastructure. And those go hand in hand. In a similar way, among the destruction of the hurricanes on the East Coast, there has been a tremendous beauty that has risen as people have come together to help each other. I know it feels like the storm clouds are gathering in the world we live in right now. It is an extremely chaotic and frightening time, a time when so many of us have so much at stake. The injustice that surrounds us does have the potential to hinder our individual freedom, our collective freedom, and the human flourishing of people all across the world. So yes, there is work to be done. There is work to be done, and we must find a way to do this work with love and not hate. We cannot fight hate with more hate. We have to find a way to love our way forward together because our individual and communal flourishing is always and forever dependent on that love. Today in this beautiful cathedral we call home, I am imagining and reimagining that in the days to come we will work together to remember and claim the answers to those important questions as our North Stars. Because more than just a destination, as Anna says, North Stars reveal possibilities. More than a map from point A to point B, they help orient us to the many ways we might make and find our way 
through the storms and chaos of life into a place of healing and a place of wholeness. Our North Stars have the power to take us out of the mindset of rules and regulations and with love offer a path that is one that comes from freedom, freedom not just for a few, but freedom for all of us. And together holding the people we love close to us, we will dance our way into freedom with the one whose love created each of us and this life we are privileged to share. May it be so. May it be so for all of us.